Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Santa Clara University campus and for the second uh, distinguished engineering, uh, distinguished lecture series on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, my name is Tokumbo Gunfumi. I work here as a professor of electrical and computer engineering and also serve as a co associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the School of Engineering. Before we start, could you please mute your uh, cell phones, if possible. And then I want to say that this lecture has been recorded and uh, the bathrooms are outside on both sides of the hallway. Thank you for joining us uh, in this new building uh, for the first in-person DEI Distinguished Lecture. This lecture series is a new lecture series approved by the Santa Clara University Dean of the School of Engineering, Dr. Elaine Scott, as part of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Program Initiative. We started this last academic year. The goal of the program is to invite successful, distinguished, underrepresented minorities who are scientists and engineers as role models to give the university-wide lecture. We want to be able to expand the picture of success because we know that it can be a challenge, especially for underrepresented minorities in engineering and science to envision their own career success when they don't have leaders that look like them. So the diversity equity and inclusion program <coughs> shines a light on what's possible so that they can be inspired and the next generation of uh, STEM professionals can come to these quarterly presentations and view success and envision their own success as well. We invite guest lecturers from industry, from academia, from research, and to come and share about their own experiences, how they overcame obstacles on their way, how they learned, what lessons they have learned, and also what lessons and thoughts they can offer to us as we strive to increase diversity equity and inclusion in STEM at Santa Clara University. Today we are honored to have Ms. John Wilson, the Deputy Director of the International Telecommunications Union, the United Nations Agency responsible for regulating national <coughs> and global use of frequency spectrum bands and the de development of international radio standards to give today's second lecture. I will formally introduce her later. But before I do, I'd like to have the acting provost, who has gladly um, agreed to join us, Ed Ryan, to come and, and welcome the audience. Please come. On behalf of uh, Kate Morris and myself, we're so pleased to be here today. I know. Lisa couldn't attend, but we're happy she sends her regrets, but so pleased today to be here. Um, I think to do two things. One is to think about this building, and it's uh, a phenomenal building. I think folks have been able to move in, get settled. Um, and while it's an amazing building, it's really not about the building, I think. It's really about what happens in the building, the people and the programs, and all of you, and the opportunities for us to create new knowledge, to create innovation, to create scientific discovery with our students, to be mentors. And so I think the excitement about the building really is unfolding, and I think will take place over the, the next year, the next four years, the next decade. And so I'm so excited to be part of that. And I think it's important um, that we have such a meaningful lecture today to sort of celebrate this new building and to celebrate this week. Um, I also just want to say a word about the school, and I think as we talk about diversity and inclusion in school, um, I think as we look at the history of the school, there's been a whole lot of work that's been done. Um, if you look at what Ruth Davis did and Shane around the pipeline programs, around summer engineering seminars, and that happened long ago, 20 years ago with Steve Gesa, I think that's the groundwork the school laid um, has a profound impact on the success today. And so when I think you look at the numbers of representation in the schools, um, we think about the number of tenure track faculty who are women being 34%, and that's probably, I think, 10th in the nation. It's pretty darn impressive, but that's because of all the work the school's done leading up to that. When we look at the students at the undergraduate level, I think um, the national trend is to have about 25% of 
schools of engineering or undergraduate degree granting are women, and we're at about 40%. Um, when we look at students of color, the national trend average is uh, 40%, and we're at 60%. And I think that's because of all the hard work and the good work that you have been doing for the past decade. It just doesn't happen. So I want to celebrate that, but I think it's important that we open today with a diverse, uh, uh, lecture on diversity and inclusion to say what's next. It's not just about representation and people being here, but it's about how do we create um, engaging spaces to retain and ultimately lead to our students' um, degree completion. And so I think, so look forward to your talk, and I think you'll give us some insights. And so happy to be here. I'm grateful for your opportunity, but I think it'll be a great lecture. And just want to congratulate, congratulate you, not only on the building, but on all the success that you've had today. Thank you. We are also pleased to have the Dean of the School of Engineering, Dr. Elaine Scott, who has given unflinching support to this series of lectures to come and give you a welcome remarks. Hi, it's just a pleasure to see you all here. And I you know, want to send out my uh, warmest welcome to Joanne to come here. She came all the way across a very long flight to get here from uh, Switzerland. So I'm uh, just really pleased that she made that trip. And it was a little iffy until, what, two weeks ago, whether or not she could actually come. We were afraid this was going to be a Zoom thing, but she's here in person, so we're very, very excited for that. And I'd also like to thank Tukumbo uh, for his work in putting this together. This, this was his initiative to have these uh, series of, of distinguished lectures, and we really greatly appreciate that. Um, I'd also like to thank some of our staff. Um, Kelly and um, Nicole helped to put this together, and our um, postdoctoral fellow, Ibru, postdoctoral fellow, our first DEI postdoctoral fellow, um, Ibru, has been working to help this along. We did a little bit too good of job with helping her because she just got a tenure track job. Um, uh, professorship, so she's leaving us. So, but it's pretty exciting. We're very, very excited for her. Sad for us, but very excited for her. So I just want to welcome you. And um, getting the chance to talk to Ms. Wilson has just been amazing. She has had an absolutely amazing career, and her career path has been absolutely amazing. So I really encourage you to listen. I think you'll find a lot of really insightful comments from her. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Now let's introduce today's distinguished lecturer. Uh, We're delighted at Santa Clara University to welcome Ms. Joanne Wilson as our second distinguished lecturer in the School of Engineering, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Distinguished Lecture Series. Yesterday in this room, Ms. Wilson gave us a special seminar on the important work of the International Telecommunication Union. The ITU is a very important regulatory agency of the United Nations and is responsible for global allocation of frequency bands for various communication needs, mobile phones, satellite communications, radio broadcast, sonar radio, and so on. The video recording of that seminar is actually available and will be posted on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to check it out. Ms. Wilson started her professional career at the Storic Bell Labs and navigated the ups and downs of the US telecommunication sector, working for large multinational companies, a Silicon Valley startup, Arecom, I believe, and then a boutique consulting firm. And then she eventually went to a mid-sized federal government contractor for NASA. Most of her career focused on international standards development and regulation in radio communications. She was elected to and served for a four-year term on the ITU's radio regulation board. And in, 19, in 20, 2019, she moved to Geneva, Switzerland, where she now holds a high-level diplomatic post in the ITU. She's <coughs> She has a, a BS degree and an MS degree in electrical engineering from Southern University at a and College and from Stanford University, respectively. 
1995, she served as a Brookings Institute Congressional Fellow for Senator, one of the senators. Paul Simon. Paul Simon. So Mills, Wilson has a lot of stories to tell about her own career trajectory, what lessons we can learn from her, and how we at Santa Clara University can attract, mentor, and retain underrepresented groups in the STEM field of science, technology, engineering, and math, so that we can promote greater diversity in STEM at SU. So we are very delighted today to welcome you here. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Wilson, Wilson to the podium. You want to sh show the screen? We'll get this together. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be, be here. Good afternoon, Provost Ryan, Dean Scott, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to be with you today and to give this second talk in Santa Clara University's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, I watched the video of Dr. May's talk last year. Uh, the bar was left pretty high, <laughs> and I realized that I had to do some real soul searching uh, so that I could say something meaningful and, and, uh, and in this important conversation. Uh, my main goal today is to share with you my perspectives on diversity, equity, and inclusion from over the years as an African-American woman who has spent her career in a field where black folks and women are way too scarce and where we are generally not at the highest levels of our organizations. I'm particularly pleased to be able to be with you here in person. Uh, this is my first business trip since uh, our agency suspended travel due to the COVID coronavirus pandemic. In fact, my director, uh, Mario Manuitz, had to seek special approval of the IT Secretary General uh, for me to travel here. Uh, it is a testament to the importance that the ITU and the United Nations overall put in diversity, equity, and inclusion that I could be here today with you. I also thank you for the opportunity to introduce you to the work of the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. Headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, the ITU is a specialized UN agency for Information, Communications, and Technology. And I am the Deputy Director of the ITU's Radio Communications Bureau. Although I have now been with the ITU for two and a half years, I am still humbled uh, to be in this role of helping to lead the agency that is responsible for regulating the radio spectrum globally. 
Today, there is almost no aspect of modern life that does not benefit from the effective use of the radio spectrum. Safety of travel by air or sea, and increasingly by land. Uh, the accuracy of weather forecasting extracted from satellite-based measurements. Precise timing and navigation from GPS. Space research and exploration terrestrial and satellite-based radio and television broadcasts, surfing the web via web Wi-Fi or mobile networks, electronic news gathering and dissemination, and on and on, all require radio communications that is free from harmful interference. In economic theory, the radio spectrum is a classic example of the commons, where individual users or nations who act independently according, their, according to their self-interest and contrary to the common good of all would diminish the utility of this unique shared resource to the detriment of all. Uh, with the relentless expansion and reliance on wireless systems, our spectrum-based services are competing for access to radio frequencies. The importance and relevance of the radio spectrum and the work of the ITUR are increasing every day. Yesterday, I gave the lecture on spectrum regulation and relative role to the ITU National Regulatory Authorities. For those who missed that lecture, the ITU, and then the International Telegraph Union, was, is the most ancient of the specialized agencies of the United Nations. Its history tracks mankind's constant march to progress first wired and then wireless communications. In 1865, the year the International Telegraph Union was founded, marks the first easily measurable stage in the journey of an idea, that of international cooperation. The radio was invented in, in 1890s, and gradually the range of radio signals increased, and Marconi made a one-way transmission, transatlantic transmission in 1901. However, problems occurred in international connections as early as, as, as was the case with early telegraphy, and it became clear that it was necessary to establish international regulations on radio telegraph communications. In 1906, the first international radio telegraph conference was held in Berlin, attended by representatives of 29 nations. And the conference adopted the radio telegraph convention that included an annex containing the first radio regulations. It also established SOS as the International Maritime Distress Signal, and it established a new radio telegraph section of the Bureau that was created to administer the convention. I think that's... The legal framework for the international spectrum regulations is established by three ITU treaties. The ITU Constitution, the Convention, and the Radio Regulations, to which all 193 member states are a party. The ITU Constitution establishes the obligation on its member states to ensure that in using radio frequency bands for radio services, members shall bear in mind that radio frequencies and the geostationary satellite orbit are limited natural resources and they must be used rationally, efficiently, and economically in conformity with the provisions of these regulations so that countries or groups of countries may have equitable access to both. Taking into account the special needs of developing countries and the geographical situation of particular countries. It also established that all stations, whatever their purpose, must be established and operated in such a manner as not to cause harmful interference into the radio services or communications of other members or of the recognized operating agencies or of other duly recognized authorized operating agencies which carry on a radio service and which operate in accordance with the provisions of the radio regulations. The radio regulations, now more than 2,500 pages, is a four volume set and it defines various radio services, set forth, for, it sets forth their use uh, via the international table of allocations and establishes procedures for coordination, notification, and recording of frequency assignments and plan modifications in a master international frequency register. 
The radio regulations have been updated 37 times uh, since they were first adopted in 1906. And the radio regulations are updated at world radio conferences that are normally held every three to five years. The world, the uh, radio regulations were most recently updated at the 2019 World Radio Communication Seminar held in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. Implementation of the international regulations is a jointly held responsibility of the ITU and the member states via their regulatory authorities and the ITU Radio Communications Bureau supported by the ITU Radio Regulations Board. The radio regulations establish that member states are responsible for authorizing uh, any and all radio transmissions in their territory or on vehicles they, uh, outside of their territory. That their stations are not to cause harmful interference to stations of other member states that are operated in accordance to the radio regulations. That the stations that member states authorize in accordance with the regulations are the right to international recognition and protection from harmful interference and all frequency assignments reported in the Master International Registry have the right to international recognition. Within the United States, the Federal Communications Commission and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration share the role of U.S. spectrum regulator. And the U.S. State Department, working in conjunction with the FCC and NTIA, oversees the U.S. participation in ITU conferences and ITU study groups. So I won't repeat the remainder of yesterday's lecture, but I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have during the Q&A. In February 2020, I had the privilege to speak to the UN's fifth International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And in that five minute talk, I told the audience about a little black girl who went through DC public schools and because of supportive parents, teachers, and school administrators, was well prepared to go on to university, earn a bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering, and who was ultimately standing before them on behalf of the ITU. So let me take the opportunity to share with you more of that story, my story, and provide context for the observations that I will make on diversity, equity, and inclusion. <laughs> I grew up in Washington, D.C. in the 1960s and 70s, in the heart of the Civil Rights era, and during a period when affirmative action programs were being introduced to begin for the first time to promote more, more diverse, equitable, and inclusive society. Affirmative action programs came about after the realization that simply banning discrimination was not enough. Companies, institutions needed to affirmatively act to address the disparities that resulted from decades of discrimination. Black kids growing up in DC in the 60s and 70s received a lot of positive messages that the future was going to be better for them than it had been for their parents and the generations before them. DC was Chocolate City. At my public schools, we sang the Negro National Anthem lift every voice and sing at school assemblies. There's my, my schools. <laughs> and Nita Simone's Young, Gifted, and Black was a prominent song in the soundtrack of my early years. There's a world waiting for you. Yours is the quest that's just begun. To be young, gifted, and black is where it's at. <laughs> From some time in my elementary school years, I came to believe and I gained a reputation of being a smart and good student. I was a member of the math club and loved mathematics. I took math classes every year through graduating high school, even though it wasn't until my senior year when I decided the profession that I wanted to pursue. Before then, all I knew was I could be anything I wanted to be. There was a whole world waiting for me. I changed my mind frequently and I, of what I wanted to be. Early on, I wanted to be a nun, I wanted to be an astronomer, a park ranger, and so on. <laughs> By the time I was in junior high, I was well-established as a top student with many interests, 
but still no stable answer to the, que to the age old question, of what do you want to be when you grow up? And then I attended MIT's Minority Introduction to Engineering program. And in the summer between my junior and senior year of high school, through that program is when I decided to go into electrical engineering. Having gotten high uh, scores on my college entrance exams, I won a National Achievement Scholarship that was sponsored by Bell Laboratories. This was before the breakup of the Bell system when Bell Laboratories was the preeminent and some would say ivory tower research institution in telecommunications. Having a scholarship from Bell Labs, I also had a summer jobs with them throughout my undergraduate years and later received a graduate fellowship from, from Bell Laboratories. I attended Southern University and A&M College, one of our nation's HBCUs. Still today, I look at my years at Southern as four of the best years of my life. My classmates and I met every evening in the engineering hall, and we worked out problems on the boards and, and studied and for our exams together. Most nights, we didn't leave until sometime well after midnight. Everyone was welcome, and although we were putting in long hours, we enjoyed the hard work, and we did well. As, I, as an undergrad, I was also one of the founders and the first president of our Society of Women Engineers chapter. And one year, I was the president of our IEEE chapter. I was also a member of Beta Kappa Nu and graduated summa cum laude and at the top of the Southern, of Southern University's graduating class in 1981. I was awarded a cooperative research fellowship at Bell Laboratories and I went on to get my master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford to do additional graduate study at Princeton. And I started my professional career at, at, as a member of the technical staff at Bell Labs in the transmission systems engineering department. Careers are a journey of self-discovery. And you must enjoy the work that you do and how you spend your days. Uh, your personality and your career must fit each other. In the first three years of my career, I learned what types of projects I enjoyed and what I didn't. It, not, it was not at all surprising that what I enjoyed doing, I was the best at. I liked projects that included engagement with others, and I did not enjoy spending my day, day after day, at my desk doing independent technical studies. Although I was immediately successful in my first assignments and had high performance rankings, I and was well rewarded, I wasn't enjoying the work. Fortunately, Bell Labs had an internal want ads called the Job Post. Once a month, the Job Post, which is a newspaper, uh, was distributed on everyone's desk. And if, um, and if you had been in your current job for more than a year, you could apply, interview, and agree to move to a different department all before you told the, your own department that you were leaving. <laughs> they, and they could not block your move. This, even to this day, this was the most radical human resources program ever. <laughs> but, it, but it actually worked well to keep people from leaving the company. So if you didn't like your job, you left your job, but you didn't leave Bell Laboratories. This is how I moved to, systems in, to the systems engineering department in AT&T's network wireless systems business unit. And I thrived in that new organization and within two years was promoted to my first uh, supervisory post. Oh, I missed a few slides. <laughs> um, let's see, in my, um, in my new business unit, I had found tremendous management support, wonderful mentorship, and a great sponsor. I didn't seek out a mentor or a sponsor, and I can't imagine mustering the courage to ask the head of our business unit to take a personal career interest in me. I also don't think I, that would have been a successful strategy. More important was to work hard, to have integrity, be friendly, to be willing to speak up at the right time and place and manner, but to deliver on commitments and also to just be lucky. And there's stories behind all of that. My career path continued. Uh, I started representing AT&T at the ITU in a task group that was defining what would become 3G wireless standards. And I was tapped to head a new group 
that worked with AT&T's Government Affairs Office on spectrum and standards policy matters, including participating in the FCC's rulemakings and in meetings with public policymakers. I had a one-year uh, Brookings Institution Congressional Fellowship where I worked on the staff of U.S. Senator Paul Simon, who's a Democrat from Illinois, and I covered trade and African affairs. Uh, that same year, AT&T announced that they were going to be spinning off the telecommunications <coughs> equipment business uh, into what would become Lucent Technologies. There's me and Paul. <laughs> and I still think he should have he should have won when he ran for president. Upon returning from the Hill, I was promoted to uh, director uh, and moved to DC to Lucent Technologies' new global public affairs office. In 2001, I joined a RACOM uh, as vice president of standards, where I led their standards development projects in the ITU and in ANSI accredited standards bodies. In 2007, I left the RACOM and became an independent consultant, later joining Compass Rose International, which is a boutique consulting firm in the telecommunications sector. In 2010, I moved to ASRC Federal to a program that provided spectrum management support to NASA's Space Communication and Navigation Program Office. And in 2013, I was promoted to be Deputy Program Manager with operational responsibility for all of AT, uh, ASRC's spectrum management support to NASA. In 2014, I was a U.S. candidate and then elected to the ITU's Radio Regulations Board and served on the RRB from 2015 to 2018 and was elected to be there the 2018 uh, Vice President of the Board. Uh, in May 2019, I joined the ITU as Deputy Director and Chief of the Informatics Administration and Publications Department. In that role, I support the Director in the management of the Bureau. I organize, I'm the lead organizer for the World Radio Communications Conference. I'm responsible for all of the, the Bureau's communications and membership outreach. I'm responsible for all of their software development, uh, for processing space and terrestrial filings, along with tools that support analysis and utilization of the radio regulations. I'm also responsible for organizing their biennial world radio communication seminars. I represent the Bureau in, manage in the ITU's overall management committees, and I'm responsible for all of the Bureau's administrative functions in, co in coordination with the relevant general secretary departments. So that's, uh, that's my career. <laughs> it's been fun. There's me on the board. There's me now at the ITU. That's me at the World Radio Conference. And uh, again, we had 3,420 delegates at that conference. My responsibility was to help the chairman get through the conference successfully. <laughs> Make sure that everything got approved and that we finished on time. <laughs> so let me say a bit about diversity, equity. Oh, and here's more on the um, my work in the ITU. And in particular, uh, one of the things that we have been doing is we've been spending a lot of uh, effort based on a, a declaration adopted at the radio conference on uh, promoting gender equality, equity, and, and, uh, and parity in the IT radio communication sector. From that, we've been doing work in terms of um, promotional work, in terms of the promoting women and uh, participation in the STEM fields, and, and highlighting all of the various uh, role models, and there are many. And I, I, I highly recommend this issue of the IT news. You'll see a, a wonderful array of women who are leading in many aspects of radio communications and in space. So about diversity, equity, and inclusion, some insights and some recommendations. Looking back on my formative years and reflecting on how I ended up becoming a successful engineer, and also looking at research, some things are clear to me. In the primary school years, it's important to spark an interest and enjoyment in math and science. 
without trying to promote a particular STEM field. Students who love math and science will be prepared to pursue any range of STEM fields. It's also beneficial for children to learn to, learn to enjoy working math problems and for them to be curious about how things work. It should be obvious that the most important strategy for increasing the number of young people pursuing STEM majors is investing in primary math and science education, including teaching methodologies, classroom resources, and in the primary school teachers themselves. In the secondary school years, in addition to quality classroom education, outreach programs like MITE and many others are effective ways of increasing the number of minority youth who decide to enter into specific STEM fields. There are a number of programs around the country. While MITES is a summer program that attracts students nationwide, there are other successful models that operate year round and that address local students. It's also clear that women and minorities participation in STEM fields varies significantly by discipline. Engineering and computer science are lagging behind other fields for attracting women students. Particular focus should be given to improving the image and attractiveness of these fields, particularly, particularly to female high school students who are still pondering their career choices. I feel like I'm missing a slide. I may be missing a slide. Attending an HBCU provided me with a solid foundation for a successful engineering career. Having kept in touch with my classmates and some of my former professors, this is the norm amongst my peers and consistent with the findings of a 2015 Gallup study entitled, Grads of Historically Black Colleges Have a Well-Being Edge. And that study found that gra black graduates from HBCUs are more likely than black graduates from other instit institutions to be thriving, strong, consistent, and progressing in a number of areas of, of their lives, particularly in their financial and purpose well-being. I found it interesting that this study had some specific findings. It said, black graduates of HBCUs are more likely than black graduates of other colleges to strongly agree that they had the support and experiential learning opportunities in college that Gallup finds are strongly related to graduates' well-being later in life. In turn, these experiences may also contribute to black HBCU graduates being more likely to strongly agree that their college prepared them for life after graduation. That's at a rate of 55% than black graduates of other, of other institutions who responded to that at a, at a rate of 29%. More than one in three black HBCU graduates, 35%, strongly agree that they had a professor who cared about them as a person, a professor who made them excited about learning, and a mentor who encouraged them to pursue their goals and dreams. Only 12% of black non-HBCU HBCU graduates strongly agree they had all three of those experiences. The profoundly different experiences that black graduates of HBCUs and non-HBCUs are having in college may leave HBCU graduates feeling better prepared for life afterwards and potentially lead these two groups to live vastly different lives after college. The key recommendation from that study was that the overall success of HBCUs in providing black graduates with a better college experience than they would receive at non-HBCUs needs to be examined and more, examined more closely and potentially modeled at other institutions. I recognize that my experience, uh, that the, I recognize that the profound, the profound advantage uh, that I had over most young people, men or women, entering the engineering workforce. I started and spent the first 15 years of my career at Bell Laboratories. After having previously been a recipient of a Bell Labs graduate scholarship, graduate fellowship, and having had numerous uh, and having had uh, numerous jobs, summer jobs, complete with mentors and supportive managers. I know that my professional and academic, academic careers began in a different era and in a, diff and in a unique environment. And at Bell Laboratories, no wonder, skipping ahead here. 
Let me go back. Okay. And at Bell Laboratories, um, uh, I know that my professional and academic careers began in a different era and in a unique envi environment at Bell Laboratories before the breakup of the Bell system, and that I had a unique advantage in having more than a decade-long relationship with my employer when I started my professional career. In addition to sponsoring scholarships, fellowships, and summer employment, Bell Labs also supported and invested in the on-campus student organizations that contributed to developing leadership and the non-technical workforce skills that the students, uh, that they would ultimately seek to recruit. While there, was a different, uh, while there was a different era, there are positive elements that can be replicated. Today's tech industry is tremendously profitable. These corporations can afford to tackle the challenge of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, and, and, uh, by using tried and true strategies. They need to invest in scholarships and fellowships for minorities and women engineering and computer science majors. These provide summer employment opportunities and mentorship programs for minority and women students. To assess the corporate, and cult the corporate culture and environment to make the changes necessary to improve the opportunity and likelihood that new minority and women employees would thrive. And they need to invest in student organizations at universities because they create the opportunity for students to gain the non-technical competencies necessary for success in engineering and computer science program. Having had a good start on one's career is not a guarantee for success. Throughout my career, some key elements were critical. From my experience, the most important key strategy would be to create and nurture high quality relationships with high quality people. These people will be your formal and informal mentors, sponsors, and friends. Also, never stereotype. Don't assume that your, your best boss, colleague, or mentor will be someone who looks like you. Be willing to leave a great job for a better one. The best career opportunities are targeted and often pre-selected. Throughout my career, people opened doors for me. The 1995 Brookings Congressional Fellowship was offered to me out of the blue. The head of my business unit told my direct supervisor to ask me if I wanted the opportunity. If I wanted it, it was mine. The head of that business unit then promoted me upon my return to Lucent Technologies. He would be considered a great sponsor. <coughs> Although I left Lucent and, and Jim has since retired, we're still friends today. A former colleague of mine recruited me from Lucent to a Raycom. In 2009, a colleague and friend who told me he had encouraged his company to create a new position and he thought I would be great for it. That's how I moved to ASRC Federal. In 2014, I was at NASA headquarters when two of the NASA senior officials said that they would be interested in proposing me to be the US candidate to run for the Radio Regulations Board. I had no idea of even thinking of that opportunity. And in December of, 18, December of 2018, I received a call from a friend who was a retiree from the ITU and he encouraged me to apply for the newly posted position of deputy to the director of the IT Radio Communications Bureau. He said, you have a better than 50% probability of getting the job. <laughs> he was also good friends with my boss. <laughs> Finally, I have to reflect that there is no more important relationship that you have in your career than you have with your direct manager, your boss. For the most part, I have worked for and with some incredible people. No doubt my bosses have been some of my best mentors and are now my lifelong friends. But there have been a couple of bad bosses in the past. And in every case, the best strategy for dealing with a bad boss is to move on. More often than not, a bad boss will not be, a success, will not be successful in the long run. So moving on will likely be a very prescient career move. This message is uh, particularly for students and people starting their careers. There is a big difference between a job and a career. You can leave a job, but your career is, your career is ongoing. Look to grow in each new job and be willing to take on jobs that stretch you. 
Before I joined the consulting firm, I had only worked on standardization and regulation of terrestrial systems. Once I joined the consulting firm, I had to quickly get smart about satellite networks and systems. That is the experience that led me to working for NASA, which led me to being elected to the Radio Regulations Board. And being a former RRB member is what made me the top candidate for my current job. So I think it's most important to establish a, st a strong technical reputation, but more importantly, to establish a reputation of being honest, hardworking, and reliable. There's no substitute for being the person who makes and meets their commitments, who tells the truth, who follows up, and who takes responsibility for outcomes, who doesn't speak ill of others, and who supports other people. You want to be the person who other people want to work with and to work for. As I conclude my remarks, I'd like to share with you some observations about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion from a global perspective. With the adoption of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, number four on education and number five on achieving gender equality and empowerment of, of all women and girls, we see a growing emphasis on closing the gender gap in STEM fields globally. Outside of the United States, particularly in many developing countries, there are major inequities in girls' access to quality primary and secondary education, and in women's access and use of ICT technologies. We must close these gaps. But while some believe that closing those gaps will be sufficient to yield positive results in closing the gender gap in women's participation in STEM, in STEM fields, this is not necessarily true. While it may be true in some areas, I caution against taking this leap of faith regarding engineering and computer science fields. What we have seen is that in the US and other highly developed where girls have e fully equal access to quality primary and secondary education, and where there is virtually no gender gap in, in uh, achievement, academic achievement in math and science among girls and boys in high school, there remains a stark and persistent disparity in the number of young, young women who choose to pursue careers in engineering and computer science. A two, 2021 US Census report states that since 1970, the representation of women has increased across all STEM occupations and they have made significant gains in social science occupations in particular, from 19% in 1970 to 64% in 2019. However, women did not make as big gains in computer engineering, computer and engineering occupations, which made up the largest proportion, 80% of the STEM workforce. Women working in engineering occupations increased from 3% in 1970 to 15% in 2019. And while the percentage of women in computer occupations is higher in 1970, uh, it actually decreased between 1990 and 2019. Other factors are leading to the gender gap in engineering and computer science, particularly a prevailing, prevailing perception that these are male fields that are not supportive of women's needs and professional aspirations. These COVID times also have shined a bright light on the devastating impact of global inequity and, con and connectivity and affordable broadband internet access. The digital divide between urban and rural communities and amongst countries has led to inequitable access to teleworking, teleeducation, and telemedicine during a time when, when people could stay, who could stay in their homes were safer than those who had to venture out. There's also disproportionate participation by developed versus developing countries in technology and standards development, particularly in the fields of ICTs. Recalling the age old adage that necessity is the mother of invention, it is possible that greater diversity, equity, and inclusivity in the development of technologies and standards will yield greater progress in addressing the technological needs, the technological needs of people in developing countries. For example, Mobile money, network independent mobile payment systems based on accounts held by mobile operators and accessible from subscribers' mobile phones was invented in Kenya and is most prevalently offered across the African continent 
where there is a significant percentage of the population who own mobile phones, but who don't hold a bank account. New technology, technologies and services are developed to solve problems and meet specific needs, as understood by the technology developers. How can universities, such as SCU, contribute to closing this technology, technology and standards development gap? Expand the concept of diversity, equity, and inclusivity to include increasing the numbers of STEM undergraduate and graduate students from developing countries, particularly in engineering and computer science. This can be done by developing both on-campus and in-country programs, possibly in partnership with other academic institutions, companies, or governments to increase the number of students from developing countries who are pursuing degrees in engineering and computer science. One exciting example is Carnegie Mellon University Africa, which is committed to educating the next generation of leaders and innovators in Africa. CMUA has established a state-of-the-art campus in Rwanda, where they offer Masters of Science degree programs in information technology, electrical and computer engineering, and engineering artificial intelligence. I believe the CMU Africa is the only American university with an African campus. I encourage SCU to consider expanding its diversity, equity, and inclusivity efforts to include contributing to the educating the future generations of underrepresented STEM professionals in developing countries. Again, thank you for the honor and privilege to be part of this lecture, of this lecture series, and to participate in celebrating the opening of this beautiful new facility. It has been a pleasure to get to know this wonderful institution, to reconnect with an old friend and to make new ones. SCU and ITU share a common, a common mission to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM. Let's work together for that, that important goal. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Everything wonderful. <clears throat> what I've been thinking is this. Let me put it a little analogy. To have a seed of good thought, have a seed, but to have a fertile land for that seed to take root, grow, and blossom. What I have observed, I'm just not being negative. Mm. Now, diversity had to flourish, but somehow, and the scaling of differences, and you know, the, the long climate, you know, white differences, and biases, and racism, all of these things, things are wrong factors. We don't want them to somehow not let the diversity grow. I don't know. I'm, I, am I been able to come across with my idea I'm, or not? I'm, not? I'm not sure I understand the question, but let you me, understand what I'm saying. Maybe well, not. no, but let me no, no, but let me let me make some observations. Um, I think if we look at each person as a as a person of value who needs uh, to feel welcome and supported and 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 happy in the environment that they're in. Uh, who, who, who needs people to believe in them. And I'm not just talking about students in a university. I'm talking about employees at a company. <laughs> you know, so, so it's across the board. You want an environment where everyone feels that they can bring themselves, their honest, their authentic selves, okay? All of themselves with their culture, their experiences, uh, and, and feel that this is a, a place where 
uh, I'm, people want me to thrive and survive and, and blossom. And again, I'm not talking about just a university. I'm talking about, I'm talking about even a, in, in, in a corporation. You know, that's what I think, you know, uh, the, the environment that I had as a, as a student at, in, a, in an HBCU, you know, was that kind of environment where everybody felt like they could be them, their authentic selves. And it wasn't necessarily the same um, in every company that I went in, um, although certainly the environment that I was in in, let's say, NASA was amazing. Uh, it's always considered the best, you know, U.S. government agency, and it, it has a great record in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and so forth. Um, so I think any university that wants its students to thrive, as well as any company that wants its employees to thrive, you know, will look at the whole person, and 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 how does this environment make them feel like this is some place where I belong, where I can be my authentic self where I can bring my passion, where I can dedicate myself to the, the whatever mission I, I have in terms of my task, and, and I'm not burdened by feeling like I have got to fight other fights. And I think that's the, 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 the kind of environment where students will flourish. I think the problem we have in, in STEM is, is one where, you know, particularly engineering, computer science, is, you know, we don't even get girls in the door, or, or not at the same level that at boys. The problem is that we, there, we have a, a, a field that has a perception, not, not I'm talking about not the students here, but before they even got to the door, they didn't even apply. You know, the, if you look at who, who, is, who is applying to become engineers in computer science, it's already disproportionately more male than female. And so we'll never get, you know, equity and, and, and parity and so forth if the, if the pipeline is already squeezed. <laughs> before they ever enter the door. So that's why I always talk about, you know, the need to, to, to look at the pipeline in terms of the, the education of our kids, you know, and, and how can you educate your kids well if you, if you starve resources from their teachers, you know, or their teachers are not, you know, are, are, are not getting paid as well as they should, or they're not having the, they have to put out money out of their own pockets in order to um, provide resources for their classrooms. Now, how can you expect them to be, you know, the, the most, you know, enthusiastic teachers? Or how can you expect that the, the, the best and brightest will go into the teaching profession if the, if the um, re uh, compensation for teaching? So I, I really think that we, we could do a lot in terms of improving uh, the numbers of people coming into the engineering field if we dedicated a lot more time and energy to you know, teachers, grade school teachers. In fact, Santa Clara is doing a great job. It's just no, 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 no. Yeah, I, I, I'm only get, getting to know Santa Clara. So nothing I said is about this university. There was a climate survey here, and the university two years ago, somehow that pointed out some kind of you know, problems. I all I'm trying to say in summary, good attention, good intentions are not alone are not enough. If something else has been done about that, we should focus it. Because you pointed out very several good points, you know, scholarship, uh, give them, give them facilities, give them, help them, you know, improve special things, you know, really great points. You know. That's what I'm searching for. You may give me some more good points so that we can really smoothen out if anything like that, because we have done a great job, and uh, this should stand as a model, especially in the new building, which is you know, great inspiration. And things we are attracting because we have more. And I think I interact a lot with the minorities and all that attract them here. So that's all what my thoughts are. Don't take me negative. But thanks for your answer. Thank you. Boys, have a nice day. Yeah, my question was just about what you said before about how the few times you have had a bad boss. In those situations, that what you mean by, I don't know if this was exactly what you said, like to move it or get by it, because I'm just thinking back, I'm a freshman, so my knowledge is limited about the real world, I'd say, but I guess my question is like, I've experienced some racism in my life, even in the school when we talked about how great it is in diversity, I've experienced situations where I'm singled out and everything, and at times, I there were moments where I would just completely avoid a class, 
because I just did not want to deal with a teacher that I knew that I would have to, I'd already had, and I knew that they were harsh on me and that it wasn't a specific situation where I wanted to be. And I try and find like an alternative way to do that. But I guess my question in a simple way is just that, what did you mean when you said like do with the bad boss, like get fired in that situation? In terms of in the importance of your career, because like your career obviously is like the end goal, that's the most important thing. What did you mean when you're talking about getting by the boss? Okay, so first, so let me not not suggest that a boss is like the boss, like the teacher. <laughs> okay, so let's let so so in a career, the person who you report to has an incredible amount of of of, of power in your career, both good and bad, okay? They can, first of all, they're the person who's gonna give you assignments, they're gonna rate your, your performance, they're gonna, they're gonna influence whether or not you have the opportunity for promotion. There's sort of like no relationship in the, in the work world that's as important as, as having a good relationship with your boss, okay? So this is not, so professor, your teacher, you know, colleagues and so forth, you know, like professor, you, it's a class, you can drop the class, you can, you know, <laughs> you can talk to somebody, you can, and so forth, you know, you maybe move on to another, but, but your boss is the relationship that you kind of can't go around them, you know, you just need to get from under them, you need to find a different boss, <laughs> you need to move on, you know, um, and I, and it's not just, it's not just so like Joanne's personal opinion, I, you know, as I've talked to other people, you know, in terms of their career strategies and so forth. Um, having a, a, a good boss, someone who, you know, likes you, wants you to do well, in fact, who relies on you, because in most cases, the boss's success is dependent on you, you doing your job well. So, um, so you know, I, 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 I don't want to draw, uh, have you think that, oh, this is, that applies in other areas. I'm just specifically about the relationship with you and your, your boss. And, and I go back to the other point that um, it's not, a, a good or bad boss is not also a matter of racism or sexism, okay? To be quite honest with you, the worst boss I had was an African-American woman. Not because African-American women are bad bosses. Trust me, I'm, I'm a good boss. <laughs> but that particular African-American woman was not a good boss, okay? And that particular person I had to get out from under, okay. But that I've had other bosses who see and, and and mentors and sponsors and so forth. And I think if you saw that that slide, it was very diverse, you know. So and which is why I go back to don't stereotype, don't assume that someone because they are the same race or the same gender, you know, or from the same place, they're necessarily going to be good. Or if they're from a different gender or race, they're necessarily going to be bad. No. Some of the best people you will ever encounter will not be the, of the same gender or not be the same race, not be the same plain background and so forth. It's the person. If I can't say it anymore, it's the person. It's the quality of the person, not their background and so forth. It's the person. And you want to develop good relationships with good people. And in order, in order to do that, you yourself have to be a good person. You can't be backstabbing and expecting, to, you know, and, and having a bad, you know, uh, impact on others, and expect people will want to be good with you. So I, so so you know, I, I I toss out it's the quality of the individual person, irrespective of, you know, their race, creed, background, whatever. You want good quality people, and you need to be a good quality person to get to have those sorts of relationships. Thank you. Court has a question. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the talk, John. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. I can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> Me either. Hello. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Speak up. Uh, it, it was it was a great talk, and I just had a lot of fun hearing about you know how you navigated and, and fell into all these awesome <laughs> positions that obviously are a testament to to how you work hard and how you. Uh, work with other people and I, I liked your statement about um, how the best opportunities come to you I think that requires getting started you know you have to build that momentum what would you say to students who are at the beginning of their career 
what what would be your advice to them for getting that ball rolling mm -hmm. for a successful upward trajectory? Good question. So I really think that um, you and I start I start with you have to have a career or a job that fits with your personality, with your passion, with your interests, because you're going to if you're going to be successful, you have to bring yourself to that job. And you have to be committed to being successful and to working well with other people toward a, a mission. You know, we don't do anything in this world by ourselves. Everything is a team and it's, an, and it's a, a group mission. But you have to be you have to be fully in. Okay. So I think when you when someone is fully in, they're going to do the extra work. They're going to you know they're going to you know, back when I was in college, they burn the midnight oil. They're going to put in the extra hours necessary to really do a good job and then when you, and then that will feed itself okay because others will will see that and they'll you'll be the kind of person they want to work with and i think it's that starts with your first job but it's always you know when i come to work am i fully at work or am i hanging out and talking so forth you know am i fully there when i'm committed am i doing you know am i when I say I'm going to deliver something, do I deliver it? Do I deliver it on time? Do I deliver it well? You know, so I've seen, I've seen great technical people who have poor work ethics, you know, and I've seen people who, who are just kind of in the wrong job because they're just not good at it. <laughs> you know, so you have to find a, you have to find a match with who you are and the, and the opportunity that the job you're going after. When I started my career, my first job was not the right job for me. You know, it, I, it, you know I, I had, I did well in terms of, you know, I was doing the job well, but I didn't, wasn't enjoying it, you know. So I, yeah, I was coming home and I was kind of complaining about it, <laughs> you know. And I, I, was, I talked to a friend of mine who said, you know, you ought to come over here. And like I said, the, the most radical human resources <laughs> program ever. I don't know of any other company that's ever done it, that literally dropped a, a one ad on everybody's desk and said, if you want a different job within this company, you can get it. <laughs> you know, because before then, people who, who were in the wrong job, they may be, you know, great, but they were just sort of in the wrong place, they would have to leave. They would, they would, find, they would find themselves looking for some other opportunity. Whereas in, at Bell Labs at that time, they said, okay, well, we like a lot of you and we don't want to lose you in the company so we'll you know let you move you know and invariably what would happen is the better places to work within the company people would move to those and if a supervisor kept seeing their people leaving <laughs> it kind of said something about them too but i think what i would say to young people starting their career is one find the job that matches your interests and your disposition and your personality and your and then and then allows you to bring your full and authentic self to it, uh, and then good things will come from that. Thank you. Um, question. Thank you. I had a yes. question that goes back to uh, the issue of moving on from a bad boss. <laughs> you spoke about what we can do, what how we can look at it, but to kind of clarify. Credit, there's an idea that I never fully understood until it was explained by Jesuit colleagues, which is if you place somebody in a situation where they don't have the freedom to make that decision out of pressure, necessity, desperation, or other deficiencies, not everyone has the freedom to do that. So the question for you is, as an institution, as members of an organization that employing somebody or somebody's a part of <coughs> do we not have that responsibility to make moving on easier to and, and i ask this specifically because the radical example you gave from bell labs the ability to move without being blocked by where you're at is a beautiful manifestation of that example but, but it's it very is, unusual exactly <laughs> so what advice do you have with regards to what an institution can be and what students can look for in the institution uh, so, outside of themselves basically so I, I i think one of the things that's most important to develop in your 
career, and, 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 and I think it happens in the university, is de in developing the whole person, is developing a sense of resilience. Um, in the sense that sometimes when people are in a situation like the one you, re you refer to, they, they think it's them. They, 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 they internally reflect it and, and they bring themselves down because they think, you know, it's me. Uh, you know, I, and, and therefore they don't feel empowered to make the move to something else. Or they don't feel empowered to say, you know, let me talk, talk to other people and, and find out what's, you know, because like I said, my, my, that first job move was me whining to a friend of mine <laughs> and him telling me, oh, our, our organization has just posted a job in the job post. You might want to take a look at it. You know, it, this was in cellular when it was just beginning to blossom. And, and it was clear that, you know, what I looked at is like, well, this is, it was the smallest business unit in the company, but it was the one in the biggest growth field. So, so, but it was, you know, sharing my feelings about my current job that allowed me to open up. He was a friend of mine who was one of my classmates in, in undergrad. So, you know, I knew him for years. And so, you know, it wasn't feeling like, it's me, you know, it's like I'm, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong job. I need to find something that's a better fit for me. So that was, I think, in, in cr critically important. I think we need to develop resilience amongst the students so that they, they can stand, you know, going into the world and realizing that I'm in the wrong place. I need to find a better spot for me. You know, I've got a bad boss. I need to move on, you know, and then, and then talk to and network with their friends to find out what are other opportunities that are better, better suited for them? So I had a question. Yes. So, um, when it comes to engineering, you always, when people are discussing it, race and gender always come up. And people say that engineering is a male dominated industry. And it was said that women aren't even applying. So what can Santa Clara do to get women's attention to apply, to actually come to school to be an engineer, what can what can be done to, to interest females to come and be I, I think the outreach program. So I mean, might was focused on minority engineering students, but I think you can also have outreach programs to, to women students, to minorities, to under anyone is underrepresented. You can do you can reach out, you know, high schools and junior high schools. You can do programs with with local schools. To, to inform them about the career and the opportunities and so forth. Um, that's, I think, what, what universities should, should be doing. I mean, there's, there's other things, too. Um, ITU has a relationship with uh, and Gina Davis, the actress, who has established a foundation on, on gender in the media. And she's particularly focused on gender and STEM. Uh, and, uh, and she looks at what the, um, the different images you know, if you look at movies and so forth and so on. So I think it's not only on universities. I think it's also, you know, other areas where we need to, to work to improve the image and make engineering look like as, as interesting and, ex, uh, and uh, accessible a career for women as, as the biological sciences. If you look in the, like, if you look at doctors and, you know, and biological sciences, you know, women are at parity there. You know, but, but engineering seems to, to not have that same um, feeling of being a place where they're, that's welcoming. Yeah, I, I, um, I think the role that the culture plays is really important. And, and, and you alluded to that, but when I graduated from college, they said 2% of practicing engineers were women and 6% of practicing physicians were women. And so I think the, one of the questions is, okay, so why did medicine turn over so quickly? Well, veterinary medicine did that. Veterinary medicine used to be primarily male dominated. I think within three years, it just turned radically into male dominated. So there are ties like that. So I just wanted to throw that comment out, but my question to you was something else. And that is, if you reflect on your education and, and going through school, you said you were a good student and, and you got good feedback for that. And, and sometimes that's a struggle in school because sometimes if you're good at school, that's not good to let people know that. You know, you, you want to you know, hold back a little bit. Depends on, on where you are. 
But at some point, did it come to you that, okay, I, I see my career path clearly. This is what I'm going to do. Because I think some people do that, not many. And I think for the student, you know, they come in and in their freshman year, they, they feel like, okay, I should know what I'm going to do. But I don't think people, most people know that. I, I think you have to position yourself so that opportunities can come and then, as you said, do a good job. And in some small percentage, they knew when they were in fifth grade. Maybe they knew when they were in first grade exactly what they want to do. But it's a big world, and there's a lot of paths that you can go forward on. So just for you personally, I mean, do you feel like you have a, a, just a, a range of things that you're following, or at some point did it come to you that said, okay, I'm going to go into telecommunications, and, and, and this is exactly the right thing for me, because it sounds to me like you're, you're quite capable, and a number of things could have been appropriate for you. So, so you see the movie Forrest Gump. <laughs> Sometimes I think I was joined Gump. <laughs> Let me tell you why. So, like I said, I was I was a good student, math club, took all you know, that that slide there. I was you know most likely to succeed, you know, most studious. You know, there was a slide on there that we had a statistician. Let me say that was the, we, we were the, t the statisticians for the basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I was the lead statistician. I created a group. The, the coach came to me and said, Joanne, I, you know, I need some statisticians. We, you know, our team, we, you know, we, we want to know the shot charts and so forth and so on, you know. So pulled together some of my friends. We traveled with the team. We took all of the shot charts, the rebounds, you know, free throws, so forth. We, we, fed, we fed them with stats every, you know, at, at every quarter, you know. That was, that was, that was the stats. <laughs> we had a ball, and the team did very well, Mayor. Um, when I, so I had a lot of interest, but I didn't know that I wanted, I didn't even think about engineering until I went to MIT to that summer program. How did I end up going to the summer program at MIT when I had no interest or thought about engineering? My algebra teacher <laughs> came into school one day and put an application on everybody's desk and said, fill this out and give it back to me. Filled it out, gave it back to her. I, hadn't even, I don't even know what I read, what the application was about. All I know was the first assignment that day was fill out this application and give, and give it back to her. She sent them in. I got a letter in the mail <laughs> that said, congratulations, you've been accepted to MIT <laughs> for the introduction to engineering program. You know? And I'm like, MIT? What's MIT? <laughs> I had no idea what MIT was, OK? But it was because you know, the, the loving school teacher comes into class and says, I'm going to, you know, fill out, I'm going to make all of my students fill in this application and send it in, and who knows, maybe one of them will be selected to this program. So, you know, at one level, it's also, you know, how do we take care of our kids? How do we put opportunities in front of them? How do we see more for them than, than they even see for themselves? You know, kids, what do they know about, you know, these? So that's what I say. We, we have to nurture math and science interests at the younger age, and then outreach programs and so forth by the time they're in high school. Because, you know, they may know they like engineering, they may know they like math, they may know they like science, they have, may have no idea what an engineer does. They have no idea what a computer scientist does on a day-to-day -day basis. They probably know what a doctor does. <laughs> and that might be why girls are more interested in, you know, because they see, they, they, they see doctors, they don't necessarily see what engineers do every day. Thank you. I have one last question. Yes. Um, and because it's a comment that at Tanaka we have two programs for high school kids and SES. And they come in here and we teach them about engineering. And that's just to address what you said. The, the question is about the study you cited about non HBC and HBC. You felt like the HBCU was a better environment for people like you to, to, to thrive. What can Sanakara do to make you thrive in a place like that? So, you know, that because that, the study, it was interesting because the study said, 
you know, it needs more study <laughs> to find out what's the, for lack of a better term, what's the secret sauce that HBCUs have. Um, but I, I'll tell you from the perspective of it's, when I was there, um, two things. One is, uh, so our, we didn't have a graduate program. So we so it was the, the undergraduate only. At that time, I think that they have, they have graduate students there. But our, so our professors, we didn't have graduate students teaching us or whatever. And, and our professors were incredible in terms of their relationship with the students. So, you know, we had very, and, and, and I was very active in all the engineering organizations, you know, so IEEE, we, 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 every year IEEE um, chapter sent a group to the local conference and we put in papers, you know, for the, in the, the contest that they had. And I, and I was the president of IEEE that one, one year. You know, we started this, the Society of Women Engineers. You know, I almost had a hard time giving up my, my first car because I had a bumper sticker on it that I loved <laughs> that said the best engineer for the job may be a woman. Oh. <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, it was just an environment where um, you felt like, and it was kind of the point that I was making for, everyone there thought you were going to do great things and was there for you and so forth. And that may exactly be the environment here. I don't have that knowledge, but I know relative to other universities, it was a very nurturing place. But, um, but let me follow up with this. When you left there for the first time, mm -hmm. how did you feel after that? It was a, it was a culture shock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Was it on the Washington place as much as? It, oh, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean. Uh, and how did you get to that? I, well, fortunately, I had friends at Stanford, you know, because I was on the Bell Labs scholarship uh, fellowship program. So I had other Bell Labs friends, and then I, of course I made friends with my classmates and so forth. So it, it it took some adjustment. I remember when I first arrived on campus, my first reaction was that I, I didn't belong because I was definitely not driving the right car <laughs> on that campus. I'm looking around. I'm driving an AMC Concorde. <laughs> That car doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> for very good reason. <laughs> you know, and it was almost embarrassing. Like, oh God, you know. So, so you know, it took, it was a bit of a culture shock um, going from Southern to, to Stanford. But fortunately, I had you know uh, established friends and relationships that I started to feel more comfortable being on campus and you know being in that environment. He was at Stanford. So you go through class. Professor asks, is there any questions? Nobody has a question. Class is over. And then they rush down to the talk to the professor to ask him a question. <laughs> What's going on? You know, and, and it's because nobody wanted to feel like they, you know, nobody wanted to, to, to raise their hand and say that I don't understand something or ask a question and so forth. Whereas, you know, like previous, you know, I got to the professor with questions all the time. You know, there wasn't any worry about, well, how are people going to see me and so forth and so on. You know, so so there was, a, you know, it was just a, a, a different, it was Stanford, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Let's thank you. Uh, I think I want to thank you. The thank the acting provost for I think it was that Freddie. To thank Tim Scott for his support and coming, and then all the faculty staff who are here and students. Thank you for coming. I want to announce that this event is a quarterly event. We will have one again in the winter and in the spring, and we would like to get suggestions from you of who we can invite. So there will be a survey after this that you will get in email, and hopefully you can respond to that. And then finally, we have a reception at this very end. So you're welcome to join us. And let's thank Kai again for very good.